Hello and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Jason Knight, and on each episode of this podcast, I'll be having inspiring conversations with passionate product people. If you like the fluffy feeling of being inspired, why don't you pop over to onenightinproduct.com and sign up to the mailing list, or pop over to the podcast app of your choice, hit subscribe or follow or whatever the button's called these days, and look at some of the other fantastic conversations I've got available. On tonight's episode, we speak about the fantastic journey from software development for the Israeli army through to project and then product management. How a passion for digital transformation has led our guest to try and share as much of his knowledge as possible. How he might try and set up his own podcast and share stories of products for product managers. And I reference a management book written by a Navy SEAL, call him a Marine, and look forward to spending the rest of my life cowering in fear and hoping he doesn't catch up with me. For all this and much more, please join us on One Night in Product. So, my guest tonight is Moshe Mikhanovsky, an artist, writer, and product management guru who started out writing software for the Israeli army before getting bored of having to do all those push-ups and heading off to start a new life in North America. Moshe is passionate about creating high-performing teams and organizational cultures and sharing his experience with the wider product community. He's also the proud holder of a LinkedIn certification in executive presence on video calls. Now, I don't publish videos on this podcast, but I can assure you he looks very impressive. Hi, Moshe. How are you tonight? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Wonderful. I really need to go and do that course. Uh (laughs) So first things first, you are currently a senior product manager for Procom out in Toronto. So who are Procom and what problem do they solve? Uh, Yes, Procom is uh, one of the largest temporary staffing organization in Canada and also in the U.S. We have uh, offices all over Canada and a few places in the U.S. And we provide IT consultants for our clients. A lot of very large organizations, small organizations all over uh, North America and also in some other areas of the world. Okay, cool. And alongside that, you're also involved with what appears to be a learning-focused community called Communico. So what is Communico and what problem does that solve? Yeah, so this is actually uh, quite an exciting uh, new thing for me, Um, advising, like a product advisor for them. This is a pre-seed startup here in Toronto that are building their beta right now. So hopefully it will uh, be public very, very soon. And uh, this is a niche social media for content creators. So content creator in a way of uh, videos, people that are very artsy. So they're going to start with several uh, categories, but extend it in the future. So in the beginning, there will be like bakers and other people that make food and painters and gardening. And uh, usually these people have a lot of uh, social media videos in other places, but they're being drowned with all the noise around it. And sometimes it's hard for people to find them. This is going to be a niche social media just for them to create community around them. So this is an advising position over there and with uh, some uh, you know, young, exciting uh, entrepreneurs. Oh, that sounds really interesting and obviously gives you some really interesting startup experience as well. Have you worked in pre-seed startups before or is this your first stab at that? I worked with more like uh, bootstrap than pre-seed, but I guess it's the same, same thing. I worked with a couple of startups before. And one of them was really in these uh, initial stages. It was when I was still in the on the engineering end of things. So I started as an engineer uh, many, many years ago. Uh, for 20 years, I was developing software. And over there, that was um, a very interesting startup here in Toronto as well, that we built a debit card solution for non-financial institutions. And I was hired as the um, second developer over there. And then uh, the first developer left, and it was only me. Uh, So I built up the entire stack, both technical stack and technical team. That was really uh, an amazing experience to build it up. Unfortunately, they don't exist today anymore, but it was really, really nice experience to have about uh, five years. Who fell apart after you left, huh? (laughs) I would hope so. Actually, I, I've heard that uh, they sold the uh, software. So the software still exists somewhere in a bank in the Caribbean, I think. But <laughs> the company doesn't exist anymore. So at least some of the efforts that we put back then are still being used by someone. So that's that's a little uh, comforting. 
Yeah, archaeologists will dig that up in a thousand years' time, and your name right. your name will be all over it. Yeah, over all the the codes. <laughs> But before that, you had a long career across a number of companies, and you've kind of touched on some of that already. But I actually want to rewind back to the beginning, back when you were doing development directly mm-hmm. uh, and building software for the Israel Defense Force mm-hmm. back in the 90s. So I can imagine a number of reasons that that would be different to what you're up to today. So for example, the 90s, obviously a very different time for software development. You're also building software for the army. Yes. So how was that experience? Because that strikes me as perhaps not the easiest place to build software and certainly not very agile. Is, is that fair to say or, or have I got that completely wrong? I think that you got it completely wrong, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. That happens. <laughs> uh, that was my, my specific experience. So I actually learned uh, software development in the army in Israel and that was in 1989. And my learning was on uh, IBM mainframes. So that was uh, quite different from what you would see these days. We all had uh, these monitors and the computer was way somewhere on the ground in a huge room. <laughs> and we even to get printouts, we, we had to go and request a job for a printout. And we got this stack of papers that we have to go and find it in this special room where they put them in what they call the hive because they had all these uh, little holes in there like a beehive with all the printouts. Yeah, so, but, but that was just my, my, um, initial studies. Then when I was assigned to a specific unit and I was uh, doing software development, it was actually, you know, it was 1990 and agile. We didn't even hear what it was on the internet. We didn't even know what it was, but we were pretty agile just because, uh, we were a very small unit and we, I was responsible for a very specific product and my users were right next door. So I was able to go and just talk with them all the time and see how they work and what they need and develop uh, things right for them. And I would be responsible also for the QA. I didn't have any QA person. I was responsible for the uh, deployment. So I I was responsible for everything. And from that perspective, it's like, you know, a startup of one person that don't need much and just release things as they are ready and, and, your users uh, uh, test them, which is a big no-no, but that's what I had. <laughs> so, but but uh, the other perspective of that, this was really the first experience that I had talking with the users. So the users were not like a remote person somewhere in the other side of the country, although it's a small country, but still, it was right next door, um, the next building, and I would just go walk to them, and we would talk, and we solved the problems together. Yeah, it's really interesting. And actually, that brings to mind a book that I read a few months ago now uh, by an American soldier called uh, Jocko Willink, Mm -hmm. basically trying to teach people to be proper leaders based on his experience in the Marines or or wherever it was, should probably remember that. Mm -hmm. But it was really interesting, because actually, this cliche of, you know, the army being all command and control and really sort of top down and heavy, and I'm sure that that does exist in some circumstances but he also seemed to suggest that on a kind of platoon level Mm -hmm. uh, which is obviously a bit different from what you were doing but from a platoon level there's actually quite a lot of agility in there because they have to be empowered to go and do those things and they have to test and learn and adapt as they go it it just feels like back then it would have been an interesting time but it it feels like you've you've probably you probably got the best out of that yeah it was really a great experience i didn't like the army life but I <laughs> the push-ups, the push-ups. Yeah, not that I had to do too many of them, but I still had to do. <laughs> I still had to do some uh, guarding d- uh, duties and some other duties, etc. And also, you know, to wear the uniform and in sometimes also to carry a gun and all of that stuff. But as a software developer, I, I can't say it was hard life. It was very re- rewarding. And also when I left the army, it was very rewarding that I had six years of experience. I didn't have any problem finding a job, etc. But then after that, you moved over to the US and then took a project management role, I believe, before moving then into product management in the early 2000s. And then from there onwards to Canada, uh, where you're based today. Yeah, so I was I was relocated by um, a company in, in Israel that sent me over to the States. And I was doing a lot of specific software development uh, projects for clients. So we had a product for 
uh, enterprise um, companies, and uh, it was integrated with um, ERP systems. And we were able to create customized solutions for our clients. My official title in some of those days was a project manager. So I was doing a lot of project management as well. And I learned what project management is all about. But I was also doing software development throughout all of these years in the U.S., uh, all over all over the U.S. with clients, etc. And, and again, great experience for talking with users, finding the problems, empathy with them, learning how to listen to them, learning to be patient with them, etc. And 2002, I moved to Canada. And uh, since then, I'm here. Yeah, so you've touched on it a few times already, kind of your interest in dealing with users and, and understanding the whole picture and, and stuff like that. So it seems quite natural that you would gravitate towards product management eventually because of obviously many of your interests and how you've approached your career to that point. But what specifically was it that got you into your first product management job? Yeah, um, I was between jobs and I wanted to look really deeply at what is it that I enjoy when I develop software. And I, like you said, I gravitated towards product management because I really enjoyed being that bridge between the business and the engineering side. I know that there is, uh, back then also, it was uh, the, the early days of Agile, but only from the delivery and not so much from the product then. And and even back then, when, when I was looking at, when I would look at, uh, Positions here for product management, it was usually a marketing position, not on the engineering or on the product side, like we, we know today. Back then, you had to look for a technical product manager, or you had to look for something like that. And I really uh, like, like I said, being that bridge, meaning talking with the users and understanding the problems, and then trying to build a solution for them that they will like using. Because I saw that when uh, we didn't do that before, or when there was uh, a gap there, there was a lot of uh, wasted efforts. And as as a software developer from the from those twenty years of developing software, my key my, my thing that I was always said like I want as uh, more people to use the software, so it will be that that's what really my outcome will be. That the more people use it, that means that the software is more successful. So, you know, there is definitely much more than that. And I learned all of that uh, since then, that it's not just about the number of users, but about the value that you give them and about really creating something meaningful for them. And and, and also, you know, wow in them. So they really love the software and not just using it. And did you find any differences between working? Uh, yeah, you, you've emigrated to the US and then obviously into Canada. Mm-hmm. They're obviously different countries, but did you find that the working practices were pretty different with, with you as a kind of outsider or was it all much the same and quite seamless? Uh, they are quite different, actually. The US, I was also in a very relaxed place in the US. I lived in Michigan and Michigan is not like the center of the, it's not like the Bay Area or even New York or, or Boston. But Still, Canada is even much more relaxed than that. And Toronto, when I moved here 19 years ago, high tech here was not as it is developed now. There were companies, I, I can't say that there were not, but there are not a lot of um, startups. And these days it's much, much bigger than what it used to be 20 years ago. So it's grown really, really fast in the last uh, 20 years. So I'm I'm really happy about that because there is many more opportunities here right now. But uh in general when I moved here it was all about you know you you do your work, you come, you do your work and you go home and you forget about your work and you relax and you spend time with your family. So from that perspective, especially if I compare it to life in Israel, in Israel people work really uh it seems like around the clock sometimes and there is a lot of uh, many, many hours that people put in, uh, not just in startup, but in like every job. I see my, my family, my siblings are still there and I see how they work. And life here has a much better life uh, and work balance. So these were the main, the main differences, really. Does it uh, become more uh, similar? I'm not really sure. Maybe uh, now, especially with the pandemic and everyone work from home, it's almost like you don't even know where you live now. It's <laughs> everyone is in the same place. You speak with everyone at the same time and people are starting 
getting jobs all over the the world because it doesn't really matter anymore. So maybe this will be even even more different. A- another difference was also that, especially where I came from in in Michigan, it wasn't as diverse as here. Toronto is and Canada in general uh, is like an immigrant country. There is a lot of immigrants from all over the world. So Toronto is very diverse. You work with people from all over the world. You hear all of these different languages all over. And when we do potlucks uh, in the office, there is uh, food from all over the world. So the diversity is also something that that is is really fun. And it helps. I, I believe it helps because there is a lot of the culture is there. It just makes it much more interesting. No, absolutely. I think we can all be a big fan of having a big range of diverse teams and, and having as many voices at the table as possible. Mm-hmm. Now, you've had a lot of roles since you moved there, a variety of different companies, even had a stint as a CTO at one point, I believe. Mm-hmm. But one thing that stuck out in your descriptions of many of these roles has been quite a, a lot of transformation. So bringing in agile processes, bringing in product methodologies and kind of setting teams and organizations up for success. Mm -hmm. Has that always been a passion of yours, being that kind of transformer? Or is that something that you've grown into? Or was it something that you just had to do out of necessity? I think uh, all of the above, if I had that option as well. (laughs) (laughs) In in some places, it was out of necessity because I saw areas that needed help. In other places, like when I was a CTO, I was a leader. I had to really put it myself and, you know, adopt or invent uh, new things uh, for the team. And in other places, I was brought in to be that, you know, agent of change, uh, if you may. So at one of the jobs, um, they uh, were looking for uh, Agile, to move to Agile, but they tried to do it internally. And, and it's very hard when you just read a few the blogs about it or a few books about <laughs> it and but you don't really have that experience you don't really know what will be the gotchas moment moment because there is a lot of gotchas and there is a lot of areas that you really need to to, to handle and you and you just have need to have that experience so I, I think the first six months that i was there the only words i i even remember in the in the uh christmas party they had this video where they recorded everyone in the office saying something and they basically ask the guy that they did, he asked people to say, you know, tell everyone in three words about the experience you had in the last year. And everyone was saying in three words something. My three words were like, agile, 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 because that's all I did. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's fair enough. But I'm assuming that in some cases, in some of these companies, you've, you've walked into a bit of a car crash, right? There's a lot of companies that, in a really bad starting position Mm -hmm. if they want to transform. Is it fair to say that that that's happened to you or have you always picked your destinations very carefully? No, uh, it's fair to say that that happened to me as well. And I also made my own mistakes as as I was going because I learned through that experience a lot. And what works in the beginning doesn't necessarily work after a while. After, you know, you practice it for a year or for two years or whatever it is, the, the thing with Agile is, is quite tricky, uh, if we're talking specifically about Agile, that you don't just implement Scrum or Kanban, or you don't just implement the, the framework. You really have to change the culture. And that's, I think, is one of the biggest uh, misunderstood things about Agile, that it's a culture change that goes throughout the entire company, not just the delivery team. And uh, I think I wrote on LinkedIn, one of my posts was that Agile is not about really changing the processes or the framework. Agile is all about the product. Now, I, I had, of course, uh, you know, I, I'm focused on the, about the product, so maybe I'm biased about this. But really, when, when I read um, uh, Marty Kagan books, uh, Inspired and, and Empowered, he doesn't talk so much about Agile, and he doesn't talk a, at all about which Agile framework to do. but when I read what he's writing and, and about in general lean product building, it's all, this is what Agile is. It's about being able to build the product the right way so you don't get yourself into deep hole or dark places that you can get out of. And, and everything around it, the ability of the team to be 
nimble and agile is just to support that. It's not the other way around. Yeah, absolutely. It feels that in many cases, people fall far too in love with the next trendy methodology or the next book that they've read, like you say. And I'm definitely never going to sit there and say you shouldn't read books because I try to read as much as I can to try and make sure that I'm at least aware of things. But when the the way that you do it is much more important than what you're doing, it, it definitely feels like you're missing something there. Mm-hmm. But is it also fair to say that you've been fairly well received at all of these companies or have there been somewhere the ideas that you come in with are just like it's almost impossible to affect that change and, and you've basically had to throw your hands up in the air and, and, and walk out because it just wasn't going anywhere or have you been quite lucky um i think in most most of the time i've been quite lucky i one of the things that I, i'm trying to do it also in different ways you know in in product management we're trying to influence influence without power so that influence is something that uh, I, in the beginning, I was more, much more, you know, head in the wall, and that was <laughs> not perceived very well. <laughs> but it, then I, I learned that there, there are different ways to do that influence, to, to try to influence without this power. So one example that I did, and it, it was successful to an extent because it does take time. And and you mentioned, you know, books about books. So I, I did this uh, book club to read inspired by everyone on the team and by also some stakeholders. So we took some of those insights from the book. And I do hear some of the times this language being, you know, I heard also after that, this language being mentioned, uh, etc. But even myself, I read inspired back to back three times. And many more times just looking into different um, uh, tidbits. And every time I read it, I learn new things. So it, it's very hard to, you know, just transform an organization by doing something like that. But at least it puts some roots and then you have to nurture them all the time to get them to grow. And and sometimes it's successful sometimes it's not i I can say it was always successful i can say it always failed Uh, i can say it was probably both (laughs) well uh, it's good to have a mix i guess yeah so on linkedin you say that you help companies build lean software products with your unique experience engineering and managing products for 30 years Mm -hmm. now obviously you only look about 30 so that's obviously a typo but (laughs) you're also at the moment working for one company so does that really explain what you've done over all of your career or are you also doing a lot of mentoring or coaching on the side of your day job? Yeah, so I really like to share my experience and I always worked for one company at a time, but I also uh, like to write about it, mentor people. So I'm mentoring people here in Toronto for a few years now uh, through the uh, Toronto Product Management uh, Association. and. Since I started being involved on LinkedIn in the last year a lot, I also, people will approach me for mentorship and I'm like, sure, I, I'm, I'm willing to help. So I, I'm glad to do that. So that's, that's one way I'm doing this. Uh, I also, you know, writing is, is something that comes fairly easily to me once I get to it, of course. So in the, <laughs> once I have uh, enough ideas uh, for it. So, so through writing both, uh, you know, blog posts or, or LinkedIn posts and uh, commenting on other people, I, I really like to comment only if I have something meaningful to say that will add to the discussion. And uh, yeah, and then uh, podcast is a great way. I'm actually building now with a friend, uh, Matt Green, that I met also on LinkedIn, like I met you. We are planning to start a podcast soon as well. So that's another way that I, I want to help. And this, this podcast is going to be about uh, product management, but with a little twist, basically talking about products for product managers. So there is um, a lot of, you know, talks about specific experiences like we, we were talking right now and everyone has their own uh, different experiences, but we felt that there is also a need for something like that to have uh, basically explain what are the different products out there that can help us to our job and what they are, etc. So we we will start with an MVP 
uh, <laughs> to see how it works and what people are, um, what value people are getting from that. And then uh, we're working right now on all the technical aspects um, of, of podcasting. You, you, you probably know that the, the beginnings are always the hardest, but <laughs> that's what we're dealing with right now. Yeah, no, it does take a bit of practice to to get better at it. So I feel your pain, but obviously also, I mean, no way endorsing anyone starting a podcast and taking away all my lovely listeners. <laughs> but we'll see. So, so this one, I guess we can share. Yeah, this one hopefully is not going to compete too much because the the uh, <laughs> the uh, the focus is a bit different. And yeah, we will see. I mean, maybe people will hate the idea and it will suck and then we'll just have to fold and say goodbye, but we'll see how it works. Well, again, in true lean fashion, we just need to make sure you do the least amount of work possible to test that and then exactly. see where you exactly. go. So I obviously wish you lots of luck with that. Thank you. <laughs> but before this call, you mentioned that you hated racism. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, that's not a controversial position in any way. <laughs> But I was curious because obviously you're uh, an Israeli living and working in Canada and you've obviously spent some time living in the US as well. Mm -hmm. And it's not, for example, uncommon to see unpleasant things written about Jewish people in certain parts of the internet as well. Mm -hmm. But have you ever had any problems in any of your jobs, either in the US or Canada, which you would put down to your background? Or do you feel that that's been quite okay kind of as you've been coming up and developing your career? Yeah, I think it was quite okay. I didn't really feel any anti-Semitism or any uh, things like that. Uh, there was one situation where I, I lived in Michigan, and it was quite interesting. Like I mentioned before, that it wasn't a very diverse community. So I, I lived in a city where it was probably half Jewish and half um, African American. So there was a very good synergy over there. And and then the, the rest around the community, uh, you know, in other cities around that was mostly uh, white American and African American. And I had, uh, at the time, uh, my boss was, um, was uh, African American and we had a client in uh, Mississippi. I won't mention the name. And <laughs> we... Uh, we had to travel there. He traveled first, and then I traveled after to, to meet with them. And when he came back, he was like, and back then I was also wearing my, my yarmulke all the time. So, you know, people would say, you know, wear it, don't wear it, uh, you know, because if you don't wear it, you are not exposing yourself to anything like that. But I was like, no, I'm an Israeli. I was in the army. I feel like I don't care about anyone, and I can do that. So <laughs> he, um, when he came back, he was like, yeah, I, I, I hope everything will be okay when you go there. You know, it's Mississippi. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, well, it's okay. I've never been there. I, I, I don't have any, I never had any problem anywhere else, you know, in America. So I, I did travel over there because he felt a bit strange as well when he went there. I went there. I also, I didn't have any problem, but I did see a very segregated work environment over there. And, and it really bothered me. But um, I, I couldn't really do anything about it. That, that's the thing. I mean, there were a client and what would you say to your client? Or you know, what, what would you say to your company? Don't have them as a client because they have this thing over there. Uh, it, it was weird. But other than that, I, I didn't really experience anything bad. There were a few, a few things here, you know, in the community where there were some swastika sprayed on... on uh, bus stations or on on the school uh, door fortunately nothing more than that well yeah i can't imagine that's particularly pleasant though but i guess at least they're not spraying it on your house or anything like that but still seems not the sort of thing that you'd want to look at as you're coming down the street yeah i remember once seeing a uh, swastika scratched into a like a child's play area mm. at, at one point actually mm -hmm. not too far from me and i'm not jewish and i still found that very uh very unpleasant so yeah yeah, when you hear about something like that, it's, it's definitely unpleasant, but it's 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 not very common. Fortunately, it's not very common, and I, I never felt any any problems. Well, that's 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 one uh, one positive note to take out of that. Yeah, definitely. So, alongside that, you've mentioned the importance of building your personal brand, and you've spoken a little bit about that with some of the social media work you're doing and making sure that you're contributing to the debate around some of these issues. 
around product management on on LinkedIn and, and Medium and other places like that. Mm-hmm. So on building your personal brand, what's next aside from the podcast on the Moshe Mikhanovsky show? Yeah, that's um, it's a good question uh, because um, I, I try not to. I do a lot of things at at the same time, and it's not always very good because then you <laughs> you drive yourself uh, thin. So, like the podcast is really interesting because I actually never thought I would do a podcast, and then Matt, uh, uh, I talked with Matt, and he said he want to do it, but he's looking for a co-host. So I was like, sure. I mean, I, I don't mind being a co-host, so that worked out really well. But in general, I'm uh, also um, uh, I'm trying to build a few a few uh, webinars about products specifically. So um, I have a good friend over here. He is an agile coach. He has his company, uh, Shai Shandil, his name, and he basically uh, I I develop with him uh, this uh, webinar about what's the difference between project management and product management. So this is something oh. that's. Yes, it's a big one. <laughs> and uh, we actually uh, didn't test it yet. Uh, we are planning to have like um, a free uh, webinar uh, to test it. And um, I, I really built it a bit more for his business because he is working with his clients on doing the HR transformations. And he wanted to, he's he seen it again and again, this um, misunderstanding of companies about what does it mean to do product management. And they are all still working in project management uh, mindset. So, so that's uh, we build that together. We, we might also offer it like to everyone, uh, just uh, as a you know a webinar that anyone would want to join and and do that. But uh, definitely, the plan is to try to test it with um, anyone that want to to learn about it and just give us feedback about it to make us better. And, and um, other type of speaker engagements like that. So I've done a few, but. Uh, more speaking engagement will be also great just because uh, like you like you see here I, I really like speaking about it <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well hopefully you'll get some uh, fantastic offers after millions of my listeners uh, come and listen to this and hear some of the great things you've got to say exactly I'm building I'm building on it and where can people find you if they want to talk to you about any of this stuff? I mean, you've mentioned LinkedIn a few times. So is LinkedIn the best place to go or do you have any other places you hang out? I also have uh, a website uh, that I recently relaunched. It's just uh, mikanovsky.com, so my last name.com. In the past, it was all about my art when I was uh, still very focused on that, trying to sell some of it. But now I, I have a bit of my art in there as a, as a side note. And and also a bit about my my writing because I also try to write some nonfiction sometimes. But in general, it's it's more about you know who I am, my personal brand, a blog that I will put some more posts in there, and some of those projects I'm working on, like the advisory, the uh, workshop, the podcast, etc. So LinkedIn or the website that's the best way. I will make sure to appropriately link them into the uh, the show notes. Well, that's been a really interesting chat about your background and, and your journey through product management, and hopefully that will be inspiring to some. Obviously, you and I are keeping touch, and I'll continue to watch your journey of interest. But uh, as for now, thanks very much for spending the time. Uh, thank you very much, Jason. This is, uh, was uh, delightful, and I'm always happy to chat and uh, talk, and I love what you're doing with the podcast. and. You know, some of the people that you had interviewed was really, really insightful. As ever, thanks for listening. I hope you found the conversation inspiring, interesting, and insightful. Again, if you could pop over to onenightinproduct.com and sign up so you could be notified of any new episodes, or pop to the podcast app of your choice and subscribe there, share with your friends on social media, and let's keep this inspiration train moving. I'll be back soon with another inspiring guest, but as for now... Thank you and good night.